my name is Samra Mariam, and I'm a trustee of the Real Farming Trust, uh, who put on the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, so I've been asked to introduce our next speaker, uh, Leah Penniman. Um, so I myself am not a farmer, but this question about how we can grow food in both an environmentally sustainable and socially just way is something that matters deeply to me, um, not only as a trustee of the Real Farming Trust, but also um, as a human being who cares about the future of our planet, um, and in my day job as a sustainability consultant. Um, so every year that I come to the ORFC, I leave very inspired and hopeful about the future of our food and farming system, despite the big obstacles that we have to face. But my interest in my work in this area has also sometimes felt a little bit isolating at times, as I regularly attend um, sustainability or farming-focused events, where I'm often the only person of color or one of the few people of color in the room. It's very nice to see that that's not the case for today's talk. Um, this is why I was so pleased at last year's conference to come across a book by our speaker, Leah Penniman, Farming While Black. Um, this book is a really fantastic mix of Leah's personal experiences and her reflections as a black farmer and an activist, as well as really deeply practical knowledge and advice for farmers and activists. And it draws significantly upon the wisdom of African diasporic farmers uh, who are often overlooked in these kinds of spaces. Through her many years of experience in this area, Leah is the perfect guide for those wishing to make their way down the variety of paths offered by the ORFC, whether it be um, as a farmer, as an activist, or somewhere in between. As the co-founder of Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York, Leah is committed to ending racism and injustice in our food system. So I'm now uh, going to keep this brief and hand over to Leah to talk about the growing global movement of farmers who are working to increase farmland stewardship by people of color, restore Afro-Indigenous farming practices, and end food apartheid, and critically, how we as ORFC delegates can help be a part of driving this movement forward. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor. I've never been on this great island before, though my ancestors on my father's father's side 14 generations ago were here, so it feels really special to be here amongst you. Um, and I thank you for the honor of getting to talk to you about two things that are so sacred to me, which are land and food. Um, if anyone is black here or has rocked with us in the black community, you know that we don't start any type of storytelling or ceremony or event without giving thanks and homage to one particular group of people. Who might that be? Our ancestors, Ashe. Um, and so I want to call into the room one particular ancestor of mine right now. Her name is Susie Boyd. She's my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. And she lived in what is now Ghana, West Africa, then the Dahomey region. And like so many people in the 1700s was witnessing her family members getting kidnapped, you know, snatched up by slavers, forced into ships, uh, sent across the sea from which there were no report backs. And she made a really beautiful and audacious choice in the face of that danger, which was to start the practice of braiding the seeds of okra, cowpea, millet, black rice, agusi melon into her hair as insurance, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on the soil and believing that there would be descendants who would need to inherit that seed regardless of her fate. Um, and that's how many of the seeds of those plants made it across the diaspora. So I invite you in this moment to think of an ancestor who had foresight for you. They made some investment so that you could exist. And at the count of three, we're gonna say their names loud and strong into the space all together. One, two, three. Ashe. The second thank you that I want to give is to the original people of the land upon which I farm. Um, I farm on stolen land. Um, it is the territory of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican people who are indigenous people who were forced off uh, by Dutch and British colonizers uh, in the 17 and 1800s to a very small, desolate, and marginal reservation in northern Wisconsin. I've had the privilege to go and visit that reservation, and I have to say that 
um, heartbroken is an understatement to see the quality of land that these folks were forced on as compared to the land that I enjoy, uh, which is not the land of my ancestors. And so I work very closely in solidarity with the Mohican people around returning lands to them, returning seed to them, and protecting their sacred sites. Um, so I give thanks to the Mohican people. And the third and final thanks I want to give before I get into the story um, is to my team. Because you'll notice that I have like no chicken shit on my clothes at all right now. And that's because somebody else does. Um, anything worth doing is a team effort. And it's because, you know, Letitia and Justin are taking care of the livestock and Larissa's taking care of the emails and the partnerships and Jonah's fixing toilets. That's why, you know, I get to be here with you all across the sea telling stories um, and to get to wear clean clothes. So I just want to give thanks for our team and remind you know, us all to always give thanks for our teams. So there's a proverb um, in Ghana, which again is the land of my maternal ancestors, that says, latte ete no no da. Can you say that? It means that you need three stones to make the cooking pot stand firm. So when we designed our farm, Soul Fire Farm, uh, back in 2010, we thought about what are those three pillars of our work that can make our cooking pot stand firm. So I'm going to tell you briefly about our work at Soul Fire and then take a travel back in history to understand what it is that has informed those things that we do. Right? So our first cooking stone is to run an 80-acre Afro-Indigenous regenerative farm that feeds the community. That's just one of the three stones, right? And so we are on really marginal hillside land, deeply eroded. Uh, we bought it from a logger, so that the forest was quite damaged and picked through. Uh, but we worked really hard to restore those soils using methods that I'll talk to you about shortly so that it could produce what everybody said was impossible. The farmers who had the nice uh, valley soils around us were like, you're trying to start a farm in Grafton? Are you crazy? Like, that's not farming territory. But you can see this beautiful produce that comes out of our land that feeds uh, 400 people every week through a doorstep delivery program um, where folks pay on a sliding scale whatever amount they can afford in order to access this nutrient-dense, life-giving food. Um, and yes, we deliver it in a very creepy looking white van made only slightly less creepy by the sticker and the cute teenager, uh, who's my, that's my younger son who has since gone through puberty, so he's not as cute, but he's still <laughs> great. He hates when I show that picture. Um, the second stone that holds up our cooking pot is what we call each one teach one. Uh, so we have a value in the African-American community that whatever it is that you know, whatever knowledge you have, is really property of your community. And so it's incumbent upon each of us to share as soon as we learn something uh, with our brothers and sisters and siblings. Um, in this case, what it means for us is that we run training programs on regenerative farming, Afro-Indigenous agriculture, carpentry, welding, seed keeping, and other land-based skills usually through a series of uh, week-long residential courses, though we also have one-day courses and one-year courses and so forth. So this is an example of um, some folks who've come to the farm to learn about the CSA model um, that we've done and how to do vegetable growing. We also have a special certificate program in looking fly while hanging onions. <laughs> come to Soul Fire Farm and you too can look this good while rocking with your alliums. I'm kidding, but not kidding, because, you know, we are pretty fly like that. <laughs> and then the final stone that holds up our cooking pot is organizing and mobilizing. You know, fundamentally, even if we have a whole bunch of folks who know how to do farming really, really well, and our farm is running beautifully, if we don't have access to land and capital, if we don't have laws that protect farm workers and that protect land tenure, we're only going to make it so far. And so we work very hard with regional and national coalitions to change policy and also to drive reparations. Now, reparations can sound like a scary word. It really just means repairing the harm that's been done. Um, and certainly in our nation, and even I would say globally, there has been a theft of land, there has been an exploitation of labor that has resulted in a huge wealth gap um, and a huge power gap. And so we're trying to fix that and, and help governments and individuals give back what was taken. <laughs> 
So that's our organizing work. And this extends internationally. We're members of Via Campesina, which is an international indigenous movement towards um, food sovereignty and agroecology. Uh, we have sibling farms in several countries, um, most notably in Haiti, where I have some family in the Leogan area. And we've been working since the 2010 earthquake with those farmers on seed keeping, irrigation, uh, solar technologies, and health. Um, and this is one of the collectives that we helped get started. They're peanut growers and they're doing a seed swap. So here they are exchanging their seed um, in Aitzi. We also work in Mexico, in Ghana, and in Vieques, Puerto Rico. So I mentioned that my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother, Susie Boyd, and many other mothers in the Dahomey region of West Africa made the beautiful choice to braid seeds into their hair before being forced onto transatlantic slave ships. And my sister Naima made this beautiful painting to honor that moment of the seed uh, being braided into the hair. Has anyone ever gotten their hair done in like a nice style with lots of cornrows and stuff? Raise your hand. Okay. Tell me about that experience. What is it like to get your hair done? It's the best. It's the best. What else? It takes a long time. What else? It's painful. Yes. Be real, right? <laughs> It's like if you're tender-headed and you're not sitting still, they're going to whap you on the side of the head with a brush. It takes a long time. It's, yes. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. And so while you are getting your hair done, your mom or your auntie or your daddy or your brother, they're telling you stories. They're telling you jokes. They're singing songs with you. The act of braiding is also an act of cultural transmission. And it is my belief that a lot of the sustainable regenerative farming practices that came with us across the Atlantic Ocean came with us because of the transmission that happened while those seeds were being braided into their hair. And I wanna talk a little bit about specifically what those practices are, but first I wanna poll the room to see what pre-existing knowledge you already have about these practices. So my question to you is what black agrarian farming technologies do you already use on your farm? And there's some categories that you can consider. Perhaps there's a certain soil testing method you do that's African. Perhaps there are livestock management techniques you use that are from the black community. Perhaps you use tools that are from the diaspora. Perhaps the way you own your land comes out of black communities' technologies. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm gonna invite you to just take one minute, turn to a person next to you, and answer this question, and then I'll ask a few people to share out. So take a minute and, and see what you already do. When I say free the people, you say free the land. Free the people. When I say free the people, you say free the land. Free the people. Free the people. By any means necessary. Ashe. All right, who's brave and wants to share what they talked about? We can take two people. There's a mic right there. I'm Barbara from Zambia, so I'm an African farmer. That's the first part. Yeah. So I will say all of the above for me. <laughs> but the thing is about it, right, when I look at that and we talk about agrarian practices, I look at myself and think, wow, is it black, is it white, is there color, or is it just we're farmers and we need to share our heritage? I don't actually know if this is an African thing, but I scythe my um, meadow with the scythe, and I don't know if that kind of tool was been used in other places, so. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you for your courage. I know it's hard to get up in front of a bunch of people. So let's talk about some of these practices. First of all, and perhaps most obvious, there's actual crops that from, come from the continent of Africa that are now used worldwide. Some of those that you might not know about include rice, <laughs> Uh, black rice in particular, which was developed by Mende and Wolof people and which spread around the world. Uh, coffee, palm, cola nut as in Coca-Cola, you know, palm as in the palm oil that's in pretty much all the processed food that all, we all eat. Melons, eggplants, black-eyed peas, basil, okra, cotton, and so forth. There are also many crops that are very popular in the United States that while they had European or Asian origins, the varieties that we use came out of enslaved African communities. So things like the green glazed collard or the moya mensing tomato. You know, tomato is a 
from Turtle Island, it's from the Americas, but those particular varieties came out of enslaved Africans. And so, of course, we give thanks for the African diasporic farmers for, for creating these crops and for domesticating these crops. Soil testing. Those are my hands. My left hand is the soil, the topsoil, actually, um, when we purchased the deed for the land that we're on in 2006. My right hand is the topsoil last summer. Right? So how do we do that, right? So first of all, there's many, has anyone ever done texture by feel? That soil test where you like make a little ball with the soil and then you make a ribbon and you see if it's gritty or smooth. Is that the thing y'all do? Okay, so it's very popular, we do this. Um, this actually comes from the Niger. This is a, an African soil testing methodology of using texture by feel to determine how much clay, silt, or sand is in your soil. Um, other African test soil testing technologies include looking at a color gradation, as well as water retention, as well as pH by taste. Actually being able to determine within 0.5, what is the pH just by tasting its sourness or sweetness. So this is something I have not mastered. I've tried and I look super silly, like trying to eat soil and determine, but I didn't grow up on it. Um, but the point being, you know, scientists from the U.S. Department of Agriculture went over to sort of compare their soil classifications to soil classifications in the Niger and had that oh my god moment, like it's even more complex here. And without all of these fancy meters, people are giving us the same data about soil. Um, so using these soil testing technologies as well as soil feeding technologies, which I'll get to next, we were able to um, increase our, our organic matter from two uh, PPMs up to 12 PPMs and improve all other measures of soil health. Has anyone here ever composted with worms, done like vermi composting? Does anyone encourage worms on your farm through detritus and non-disturbance? Very good. So the first person documented to use worms in compost was actually Cleopatra, um, who lived between 69 BCE and 30 BCE. She put out a law that said anyone who harms an earthworm would be put to death. That's pretty intense. And I personally am not in favor of capital punishment, but I think that's pretty badass, right? That she had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time work was dedicated to the study of the habits of earthworms in order to increase and proliferate them across the Nile River Valley and to create that high fertility that's responsible for you know, the cradle of agriculture and so forth. Again, US scientists in 1949 went over and took soil cores and found that the number of worm castings during her reign was 10 times higher than it was anywhere in the Americas or Europe at that time. So there was a really intentional like sheet composting um, going on that we can appreciate because so many of us now understand the value of earthworms. Another example of a African uh, soil enhancement technology is called dark earth. So this is practiced in Ghana and Liberia, mainly by women in the community. It involves a combination of ash, bone, uh, crop residues, residues from making soap and palm oil, and detritus from the kitchen. And it's combined in a particular way um, in order to create this super black, super rich compost. What's amazing about this compost is, of course, it is, is so carbon rich, it actually sequesters about three times the amount of carbon as a standard soil. And the elders in the community will read it like rings of a tree to determine the age of their town. Because every single generation is responsible for laying down a certain amount of that dark earth and do so, so reliably that you can actually read the rings of the generation at least 700 years down in communities where I've been. Um, so composting. So let me ask you, what do you see in this picture? What would you, yeah, what do you see? Slash and burn agriculture, yep. That's what I thought too. I studied environmental science in college and I thought like, you know, the people who do this are the ones wrecking the planet and all this stuff. What I didn't learn about in college, which I've learned since, is that the more respectful name for this type of agriculture is Swidden agriculture. And it's really a long range crop rotation. So um, how many people here rotate their crops? Do you include a fallow 
Do you include a fallow period? How many people are cover crop in the rotation? Okay. So the original cover cropping and the original fallow comes from Swidden agriculture. The way it works is that you intensively cultivate a plot of land for a year or two until the soil uh, becomes depleted of certain key nutrients, right? And then you allow it to fallow and the forest to come back for about 20 to 30 years. In 20 to 30 years, a forest grows. A forest has deep roots that are able to mine the soil, the deep soil, for the minerals that are necessary and then put them on top as detritus to restore water cycles, right? To stabilize and prevent erosion, to capture 100,000 tons of carbon per hectare, right? That's what a forest does. And by the time you come back to it 20 to 30 years later, it's ready for you. The problem is that when you steal people's land, when you steal indigenous people's land and force them into smaller and smaller areas, the rotation is not 20 to 30 years. It's 10 years, and then it's five years, and then it's three years, and then it's no longer, Sweden agriculture is no longer sustainable, and you have this damaging slash and burn. Not because indigenous people don't know how to farm properly, but because they've been forced into very small areas of land globally. But we still can give thanks to indigenous farmers around the world, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, for this technology of the crop rotation. Who here has heard of permaculture? It's kind of a trick question. Okay. <laughs> permaculture isn't real. <laughs> I'm saying an unpopular thing. Permaculture isn't really real. Permaculture is um, the amalgamation of a number of indigenous agroecology technologies that have been rebranded, packaged, and sold mostly by college-educated white men to turn a profit on their courses. But the actual techniques that are rebranded as permaculture do exist. And I think it's so important for us to honor the source of each of them by learning about the history, naming them, and if we're gonna pay royalties to anyone, to pay royalties to those indigenous people who created the technologies, right? So one example um, is agroforestry, which is still a really broad um, category, but essentially the idea where, you know, you plant trees in guilds, and then around the trees you have all of these um, perennial herbs that both produce medicine, they attract pollinators, they mine the soil for nutrients, they accumulate toxins, right? And then maybe you have your annuals and you're grazing um, animals throughout, and so you have this integrated system. This here is a nursery that we helped create in Haiti uh, for their agroforestry. And so we're growing moringa together with cherry, um, limon, and then around it we have these erosion-controlling grasses called uh, vetiver, and rosso that stabilize the hillsides. And then around that, you can put annuals because now the soil's been stabilized. Um, there are many, many cultures that originated agroforestry, but I think it's of note that in Nigeria alone, Western scientists have documented only over 26 different kinds of tree guilds and agroforestry mixtures that are commonly used. Um, and so certainly African farmers have had a huge part in developing these systems. In East Africa, um, there is a technology called fanyaju, which is one of my favorite words. Can you say that, fanyaju? In Kiswahili, it means throw it upwards. Because when you build a terrace, that's essentially what you have to do, right? The erosion pushes the soil down the hill. In order to make your terrace, you dig the soil and you throw it upwards and then put some kind of a, you know, temporary barrier to hold it in place while you get the deep roots going. So this is us on our farm creating our Fanyaju terraces, uh, modeled after uh, both East African technology and also Mesoamerican technology. We built it with some Oaxacan farmers. And we have harvested out of the forest some downed wood to hold the terrace in place while we plant our apple trees and our plum and pear trees. And once those are established, you know, the temporary barriers can rot away and the terraces will stay in place. Terrace agriculture is 25% more productive um, than flatlands agriculture, and it sequesters four times as much carbon. So we give thanks to black farmers and indigenous farmers for terrace agriculture. Not to mention you can grow on places that you couldn't otherwise grow, right? The hillsides. Does anyone here use a hoe on their farm? <laughs> You're like, what kind of hoe are you talking about? <laughs> 
We make lots of dirty jokes about that, like, I like to hoe with my shirt off, do you like, you know. Um, and I'm not talking about those, like, chintzy little hoes that you buy inside of the, you know, we have Home Depot, I don't know what store, you know, but the um, garden store. I'm talking about those, like, if you go to Haiti to buy a hoe, the thing must weigh like eight or nine pounds, just the head, right? It's big. So every time I go, I, I stuff my luggage with all of these like sharp metal, large objects. And then I have a really hard time getting back through customs, but it's worth it. Um, because here's the thing, the hoe is an African tool and it is still to this day, the most widely used and the most versatile farming tool. Wetlands, drylands, uplands, lowlands. You can do your primary tillage, your secondary tillage. You can harvest with it. You can clean out the weeds, right? The hoe is, if you, if you have one tool, like one tool, um, it's the hoe. And obviously there's many derivatives of the hoe and many other technologies. Um, black folks came up with you know, the sprinkler system and the refrigerated truck and we can go on and on. Um, but I like, to, I like to call it that original technology. Transplanting. Does anyone here transplant? You kind of have to, right? If you're in a cold climate, you have to start your seeds. Um, when I have young people on my farm, I always tell them like, think about when you were little and you're in the nursery and you get, you get lots of blankets around you and extra attention because you need to be fed every two hours and you're tender to the cold. You know, baby plants are like that too. And so the idea of a nursery, a place where you can put extra focus on those plants before you put them outside into the field, makes a lot of sense. And the first nurseries to be documented, co-evolved, um, once one among the Menze and Wolof people in their rice cultivation, um, and the other in Mesoamerica with the Chinampas in what is now central Mexico. Those are the first documented nurseries, the first documented transplanting, which all of us now pretty much use. Um, these are rice growers here, and they deserve a special shout out because in the US, in North Carolina, South Carolina, in those areas, a multi-trillion dollar rice industry uh, was created starting in the 1600s based on the knowledge and the unpaid labor of these farmers. These farmers were specifically kidnapped because they knew how to do rice. It was a wet area in the Carolinas. They were brought over, told to create a rice industry, um, which continues to thrive today, very much based on the technology of the Wolof and the Mende people. Livestock. Does anyone know what the oldest livestock is in the world? It's not in this picture, so don't be fooled. But it's related. I guess you could consider the dog. The guinea fowl. The guinea fowl. Um, so we, we see that like humans and guinea fowl at least 20,000 years ago were like hanging out in the same place based on like footprints in the mud that were fossilized, right? <laughs> So um, the chicken is a relative of the guinea fowl, but they really co-evolved with human beings um, first in East Africa and then spread around the world. Chickens in particular have a very close relationship with black Americans because during the colonial times, um, black people, enslaved Africans were not allowed to own any livestock. Um, and the Virginia codes listed out the livestock that black people were not allowed to own. Horses, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, turkeys, they left out chickens because they assumed like chickens are sort of nominal and unimportant. So black people became like expert chicken farmers. So almost all the varieties of chickens that we have and the types of housing and the ways we think about raising chickens very much came out of enslaved Africans in the southern part of the United States because all they were allowed to raise was chickens. And there's, um, you know, these interesting historical records of, of um, president, you know, at Monticello, ordering X number of chickens and eggs from, from the black community. So a lot, a lot of the varieties we have are, are thanks to um, black farmers, as well as the strategy of rotational grazing. When colonizers came to the shores of West Africa, uh, 15 and 1600s, they were amazed to see, you know, the way that livestock and crops were rotated, creating this unending cycle of fertility. How old do you think that tomato is? It's in Burundi. A month. Anyone else? An hour? Right. <laughs> That's a good guess. It's five and a half months old, um, this tomato, and it's fresh and it's firm. And the reason that it is is because it's been buried in sifted ash underground for that amount of time. So this farmer in Burundi um, is using... Uh, 
ash as well as clean sand in order to preserve vegetables over time. Other technologies for preserving food include uh, blanching and drying, salting, smoking, and fermentation. Um, these are in Sub-Saharan Africa is the first documented cases of these types of food preservation, which now of course account for why we can have food at all different times of year um, and have foods out of season is because we know how to do you know, root cellaring and drying and fermenting um, and smoking and so on. So I'm gonna see how advanced this group is because someone taught me this when I gave, showed this slide earlier. First of all, what do you see at the surface? What type of, of farming is this person doing? Mounding or raised beds, yep. Does anyone know what that green thing is for on top of the mounds? No shame if you don't, I didn't, and then someone pointed it out to me. So this is the Ovambo people in Namibia. Those are leaves of a neem tree that, true to their name, are actually nematode repellent to protect the yams. Awesome, right? <laughs> I had no idea. I put it up because I think that mounding is brilliant. I certainly use raised beds. Um, I have heavy clay soil. If I didn't use raised beds, my whole farm would be completely flooded and compacted. Um, when we had a big uh, hurricane in 2013, the farms around us, and I don't celebrate this, but the farms around us that were just doing sort of like standard row crop agriculture lost between a third and a half of their soil, just washed away. Because we have permanent and semi-permanent -per semi raised beds, it channelized a lot of that water and we lost about 10% you know, of our soil. Um, raised beds, again, first documented among the Ovambo people of N Namibia and they build a number of kind of mounds. Some of them are 10 foot by five foot, one foot high, like long beds with the um, pathways doubling as irrigation ditches. They mounds, onto the mounds they add uh, cattle urine, muck from the swamps, ash, termite dust, compost, um, and other organic matter in, in order to increase and concentrate the um, fertility in the soil. And then of course to control water, to control drainage, and to have an early warming of the soil. Do y'all do um, work parties here? Do you have work parties like where you invite people over to your farm and they help you out? Okay, it's a very popular thing that we do. Because otherwise, how are you gonna get like, those big tasks done or those tedious tasks? The first work parties that we know about were in the Dahomey region called Dokpwe. When they came to Haiti, they were renamed Kombit. But the basic idea is that if I go over your house on Saturday and plant beans with you, I can count on you to go over to her house next Saturday to plant beans, and then you're gonna come to my house on the third Saturday, and when the harvest comes, we will also rotate in that way. We're part of a society of mutual aid. Whoever is hosting the work party provides the soup and also provides the band. There is always music because it's tedious otherwise. And if it's a particular hard task, it's gonna be a brass band. Um, if anyone's ever heard of rah-rah music, that comes out of these work, work parties. Um, and so we give thanks to farmers in the diaspora for helping us think about what uh, collective labor can look like. In a similar way, does anyone bank at a credit union? Or like use a lending society of some kind? Okay, so the very first credit unions were uh, black women in West Africa. They're called Susus. There's many other names, but in the Caribbean it's called the Susu. And the most trusted elder woman is the Susu Ma. She's the one who holds everybody's money. So you, every week you put in a certain amount of money, you give it to the Susu Ma, and when it's your turn, you get your loan or your grant out of the collective pot. So you can buy a new cow, you know, you can put new thatch on the the market stall, you can buy seed, and so forth. And this became the proto-credit union, which is the collectivizing of money and resources in order to support our farms. So when I was last living in Ghana, this was back in 2002, I've been there a couple times since, but not for long, I was hanging out with um, some elder farmers, they're called the Queen Mothers, and they were really challenging me about our farming practices um, in America. They were essentially like, is it really true that y'all like put a seed in the ground, you don't pray, you don't sing, you don't dance, you don't even say thank you to the earth, and then you demand that the seed comes up and gives you food. So I said, yes, that is true, <laughs> shamefully. Um, and they said, that's why you're all sick. <laughs> you are all sick. 
because you treat the earth like a commodity and not like a relative. The earth is a relative. Um, so perhaps most importantly, when we talk about African diasporic farming technologies, we need to talk about the spiritual as well, right? The fact that um, we do need to sing and dance and pray and whatever our understanding or conceptualization of God is to engage our souls, right, with the land. So here we are looking a fool, but we are, we just put some seeds in the ground and we're giving thanks to the seeds and the soil and the rain. A few more examples. I tried to take out most of my US-based ones, but I had to give a few. Um, do you all have extension agency here? No, so extension agency is basically this idea where the government actually pays farming experts to go help farmers. So instead of having to go to the university, like the university comes to you. So this actually started with um, black farmers created their own university, Tuskegee University, back in the 1800s and found out that you know, most folks were too poor to go to college. So they got a mule and a cart and they took the farming experts out to the rural areas and they did this really cool idea. It was like extreme farm makeover where they took like the most busted farm with the sickest animals and the eroded soil. They invited everybody over and they completely fixed it up. They redid the fences, they pruned the trees, they nursed the animals back to health and that became the demonstration farm for everybody to come to. Um, it was called the Booker T. Washington Agricultural School on Wheels and became the prototype for the U.S. extension system. Two more U.S. examples. Um, do you all have like um, community-supported agriculture or any type of subscription program for farms? Okay. So that came from another professor at Tuskegee, Booker T. Watley. Um, realized that farmers were not going to be making any money doing wholesale at a small scale. They had to be direct to consumer. So he came up with the idea that if you could get city folks to feel connected to your farm through a newsletter, an exclusive membership, and discount prices, you could get them to subscribe and then they would you know, get their weekly delivery or they would even come to, the, to your farm and actually pick the vegetables themselves. And they would pay you to pick the vegetables. He called it pick your own, right? And so a lot of that direct farm to table comes from Booker T. Watley. And then the, the final US example, this is, um, has anyone ever heard of George Washington Carver? Okay, so George Washington Carver, black farmer, 1800s, people thought he was nuts because he was trying to tell farmers to take their land out of production and plant it in leguminous cover crops and just turn them back into the soil. Like, what? I'm not going to make any money from that. So he was quoting Bible verses, you know, God says whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And God is talking about the earthworm. Right? But he had a generation of farmers, you know, planting their crops in clover, in peanuts, and in black-eyed pea in order to restore the degradation caused by the monocropping of cotton under slavery. A whole generation of regenerative farmers you know, and this is be way before Rodale came out in 1940, claiming to have started organic. Things like the Community Land Trust came out of the black community um, in an effort to own land collectively. Uh, the New Communities, 1969, started by the Sherrod family, was collectively owned 6,000 acres by 500 black families. It was the first community land trust in the world and it sparked the community land trust movement. Food hubs came out of the Mississippi black community. A food hub is when we all put our produce together and market it collectively so that we can attract bigger markets. Um, this is Dorothy and Philip Barker receiving an award for their role in starting the food hub movement. Soil remediation. You know, if you get like a bunch of lead and arsenic in your soil, I know my daughter was lead poisoned because of um, lead in the soil when she was a baby. I became a lead soil activist and got very involved with phytoremediation. You can use this little African flower called a pelargonium to suck out heavy metals from the soil and then move them to a safe lined landfill, a safe space in order to restore the soils back to health. This came out of the urban black community in response to the poisoning of our children from toxic metals in the land. So my question is, you know, not to say that people all around the world didn't contribute to sustainable agriculture, but right now I'm uplifting the black community because so often it's assumed that regenerative ag is either European or ahistorical, right? And I wanna point out that all of our communities contribute. 
But my question remains that if black folks have had so much to do with getting this real farming movement going, why aren't we flourishing? Why aren't we flourishing? Why, why isn't most of this room you know, made up of folks of color? And I'm gonna offer a few reasons why I think that might be, and an invitation for you to consider action. So again, I'm kind of an expert in like US racial history, so just forgive me if I like say the wrong thing about here, but I, I tried to do my research. Um, like in the United States, farming here, meaning uh, being a land-owning, business-owning farmer, is the whitest profession. I found the names of you know, in your media, just like a handful between one and three, depending which media I look at, of um, commercial farmers who are recognized by the government as farmers who are also black. So it's definitely, in the US also, farming is the whitest profession. Yet, farm labor in the United States is actually the brownest profession. For us, it's mostly Mexican and Caribbean migrant workers who come and do work for sub-minimum wage. Um, often under very dangerous conditions, long hours and without breaks in order to produce the food that comes to our plates. Similarly, as I understand it, according to The Guardian, about 90% of British fruit, vegetables and salads are packed by workers from overseas. And so there's a mismatch between the people who are controlling the farms and the people who are working the farms, a mismatch in terms of power and access. I'm gonna read this quotation from Wendell Berry. It says, the white man, preoccupied with the abstractions of the economic exploitation and ownership of the land, necessarily has lived on the country as a destructive force, an ecological catastrophe, because he assigned the hand labor, and in that, the possibility of intimate knowledge of the lands to a people he considered racially inferior. In thus debasing labor, he destroyed the possibility of meaningful contact with the earth. He was literally blinded by his presuppositions and prejudices. Because he did not know the land, it was inevitable that he would squander its natural bounty, deplete its richness, corrupt and pollute it, or destroy it altogether. The history of the white man's use of the earth in America and across the world is a scandal. I find it very powerful that Wendell Berry wrote this. And I also find it very powerful to think about the intimate and inexorable connection between the way we think about farm labor and justice and ecology. They're actually not two separate issues. By saying that the earth is not worthy of my hands and thus people who do not look like me need to do that labor, we're also divorcing ourselves from the planet, right? They're connected issues. Land access is, of course, a huge barrier. My understanding, um, again, according to The Guardian, is that about half of England is owned by 1% of the population and that those land tenure patterns have not shifted for many generations, that the same aristocracy and the same institutions that held land centuries ago continue to hold land. And so it's a question we have to ask ourselves, what does land reform look like? Pablo Neruda said, pardon me if when I want to tell the story of my life, it's the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Malcolm X said it in his own way. Land is the basis of all revolution, all freedom, all justice, all dignity. This is hard to read, but I'll summarize it. Um, from your ethnicity facts and figures, it looks like people of color have persistent poverty in this country. Persistent poverty meaning being poor year after year after year after year, particularly when you separate out housing costs. And so if you are low income and low wealth, it will be very, very difficult to gain the capital that you need in order to start a farming enterprise. We also have the problem that the agriculture that we do right now is destroying the planet. So all of these beautiful seeds that were braided into our hair that share the wisdom of, of deep, rich, dark compost and the wisdom of agroforestry are either ignored or appropriated, which is why agriculture is driving climate change, biodiversity loss, and water withdrawals. And I would say the final barrier that we have is trauma. There is no way that for 500 years your ancestors can go through forced displacement, slavery, 
sharecropping, convict leasing, migrant labor, land theft, genocide, and not look at the lands and be like, oh, hell no, right? I know when my ancestors rolled over in their grave when they, I said I was going to be a farmer. Like, are you kidding me? I worked this hard to get you here. I'm an engineer, I'm the, and you're going to be a what? Right? So the problem is that the land was the scene of the crime for many of us, many of our peoples, but she was never actually the criminal. And so we have confused the scene of the crime right, with the agent of that crime. And for us within our communities, there's a healing that we need to do to again remember that the earth is the place of the Orisha, the place of our ancestors, the place of our truth. And that, that's work for us to do between ourselves, but it's work also for our allies to support us in doing. So to conclude, I think there's something we can all do in order to deepen the respect that we have for the black agrarian tradition among all traditions and also to carry on the legacy of those seeded, seed braids, that knowledge, right? And it's all very simple. Comes back to reparations, which means repair. I think all of us can reflect that we may hold some privilege in the food system, right? We may have access to land, we may have access to capital, we may even have access to knowledge. You know, we know how to build a website, we know how to do soil testing. How are we taking what we have and giving it back in the spirit of reparations to those who do not have access because of historical conditions, right? So I invite us to think about what time might we have access to? What money, what land, what connections, resources, platforms, power that can literally be given back? Um, we've taken some time in the US to interview over 500 black farmers about what they need and to create a whole platform uh, which is on our website, Take Action, that has specifics about what that means. But here, I invite you to listen to, you know, the few farmers and growers and folks of color who are here, who are offering workshops. Go to their workshops, listen, ask, what can I do to support the work that you're already doing? I'm not going to try to be your savior and come in and tell you what to do. I'm not going to try to win you over to my cause, but I'm going to find out what is going on and how can I be of support. And so I leave you with the question, what seed are you going to plant? And Toni Morrison, in blessed memory, who just became an ancestor, um, suggests this for our seed. She says, see, see what you can do. Never mind, you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind, you born a slave. Never mind, you lose your name. Never mind, your daddy dead. Never mind, nothing. Here, this here is what a person can do if they put their mind to it and their back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage, and if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here on this planet, in this nation, in this country, right here, nowhere else. We got a home in this rock, don't you see? Nobody crying in my home, nobody starving in my home. And if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it, grab this lands. Take it, hold it, my brothers. Make it, my sisters. Shake it, my siblings. Squeeze it, turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it, kiss it, whip it, stomp it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Leah. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. <laughs> Um, if you ask white people in this country where they come from, no one knows. Um, we were displaced by a process not called imperialism, but called enclosure, some, you know, from the 16th century onwards. What does this absolutely profound vision of reparations and indigenous land claims mean for white people who are displaced in global north countries today? So I definitely have to lean into the folks of color here as expert on that, and I know there's a workshop right after, so I don't want to speak for you, but I would say that it's incumbent upon us to take a global perspective. Um, empire and colonization has impacted the entire world, and I know for a fact that in sub-Saharan right, Africa right now, 
Um, there are corporations from the UK and the United States who are doing land theft there. And so I encourage us to educate ourselves and think about our responsibility on a global scale to heal and repair the, Im the historical impacts of colonization and empire. Uh, because certainly this small island and the United States do not rely on resources just within our own boundaries. We're sucking resources from across the planet and that's having impacts um, on indigenous populations around the world. I think we have time for just like one more question and then I'll be back at the table. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about uh, the other farmers in your community and what you had said was that when you first arrived they were really sort of confused as to why on earth you were trying to farm this marginal land. Has that relationship evolved as you've been there and have you been able to kind of encourage them to see why your approach has value and, and grow that relationship? Yeah. So I definitely cherish my relationship with the other farmers and I think that farmers have more in common with each other than you know, even conventional farmers or farmers of different races. We sort of have this unity and bond and so we're very close. I would say that um, the proof is in the pudding. So once we started producing our product, we certainly uh, garnered more respect from the farmers around us and, and we weren't trying to get marginal land just to prove a point. We didn't have money, you know, our, we didn't have trust funds or anything, and so we purchased the $2,000 an acre hillside that we could afford. Um, other people, you know, had more access to resources, but it, we, we do definitely invest in those relationships, and folks have now come to us to ask how can they um, make their food available to low-income communities, and so we created a manual and started doing courses for the farmers around us to show that methodology, and also to help them make connections to institutions to get their um, nutrient-dense food to the people who need it most, so that's been really exciting. Thanks, everyone.